I've never been a, a real big sports fan, but for some reason, I decided that I wanted to play baseball when I was in third grade. And I was just, just the way my birthday falls, I was a month too young to join the regular little league team, so they put me on a t-ball team. And uh, most of those kids were as much as, as three years younger than me. So I was bigger, I was stronger, I was more coordinated. It was ridiculously easy. And then the following year, I moved up to the other, the next level. And then I was the youngest, right? And all the other boys were bigger and stronger and more coordinated than me. And they threw the ball a lot harder. And so I was, I was nervous going into every practice. You know, if I managed to get a hit, it jarred my hands. If I caught a throw, it stung. And one day we're just warming up. And this kid hauls off and throws the ball really hard. It glances off my mitt and hits me in the face. And I saw stars. You know that feeling when you just can't even see straight, where pain is just so blinding. And of course, I recovered after a few minutes. It wasn't a, a big deal, but, but I didn't last in baseball much longer than that. <laughs> I think we all have those moments where we experience pain, and it, and it leaves us feeling disoriented. But sometimes that pain doesn't go away, does it? I mean, whether it's something physical or, or even emotional, it, it can stick with us. It, it can cloud our vision. It can end up straining our relationships and, and even our relationship with God. And, and so as we've been working our way through Luke 14 through 19, we've seen that the gospel that saves us changes our lives by shaping our hearts. And the question we need to answer today is, does it also affect how we deal with suffering? See, I think Luke 18, 31 through 43 reveals three truths about Jesus that help us see through our suffering. His gospel gives us the, the clarity and the perspective that we need to persevere and to even find joy in all of life's hardships. So as we look at these verses today, I want to encourage you to lay hold of these, of these truths. And the first one is that Jesus suffered. You know how a lot of people uh, talk about the power of positive thinking? Right? And it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to acknowledge God's blessings and to be thankful um, but some people push their positivity to the extreme. You know, there are people that say that evil is just an illusion. There's people who say that the way to overcome suffering is, is sort of by pretending that it doesn't exist. Right? We, we kind of hear that mind over matter, right? But that, that mindset can be dangerous because it blinds people to the reality of life in a fallen world and it blinds us to our need for salvation. Here in these first few verses in the passage, verses 31 through 34, we see that the 12 apostles are caught up in a similar delusion. You know, on several occasions throughout his ministry, Jesus uh, alludes to the suffering that awaits him. And, and they're oblivious to it. Right? And so as they prepare to enter Jerusalem, this is right down probably to about a week before the crucifixion, he's very explicit about it. But again, the, the apostles are just blind to it. Take a look at verses 31 through 34. It says, And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. And will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. And then verse 34 says, But they understood none of these things. It says, This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. Now, the disciples uh, and, and their fellow first century Jews, they didn't deny the existence of evil and suffering. I mean, they felt it acutely. They were oppressed by the Roman Empire, and they wanted the Messiah to come and rescue them. 
but they believed that he would just come and exert power and take control. And so their vision for the future was entirely triumphant and positive. Right? And so they were blinded to the messianic prophecies like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 that predict suffering. So for instance, Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. We understand that Jesus needed to suffer to pay the penalty for our sins. He he died in our place to satisfy the wrath of God. So that we can receive uh, God's forgiveness and, and eternal life. Positive thinking. It doesn't make that happen. Positive thinking doesn't save us. We have to, actually, we have to start by thinking negatively. We have to recognize our sinfulness and God's judgment. And we need to believe that Jesus suffered on our behalf. But how does that truth, that gospel truth then, how does that shape the way we view our own suffering? Let me suggest a few ways, four of them here. First, God often uses our suffering to open our eyes to the gospel. I mean, difficult circumstances have a way of of humbling us so that we see our need uh, for salvation. And we find that dynamic at work here, I think, even in the apostles. Right At this point, they don't understand, uh, really understand the gospel. It's not until they suffer through the grief of denying Christ and then watching him die that they begin to understand and and then seeing him rise from the dead. And in a minute, we'll read about a blind man who his suffering, I think, leads him through that same process. It gives him a clarity and understanding. And I would say I've even experienced that in my own life. God used the loss of my grandfather. I was really close to him. And I lost him just a couple months before I heard the gospel. And God used that to draw me to Christ. So, God uses our suffering to open our eyes to the gospel, but he also uses it. Secondly, I think the suffering of Jesus here teaches us to expect suffering. I mean, some of us expect that life should be easy. If anything hard or painful comes, we're like, is there a pill for that? Right? Because we want it to be fixed right away. Um, And there are even false teachers that claim that if you just have enough faith, you won't have to suffer. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that when you're faithful, when you trust God and follow Him, you face opposition. You face difficulty. Do you remember the story of Job from the Old Testament? I mean, Satan attacks Job with storms and thieves and physical sickness and critical friends, all to attack Job's faith. And when you follow Jesus, you become a target for similar attacks. That's that's the reality of it. In fact, Jesus talked about that. Matthew 10, 25 tells us that he warns his disciples to expect to be treated the same way that he was treated. He puts it this way. He says, it's enough For the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? It kind of goes together. Another thought, the third, the suffering of Jesus sets an example for us as we go through suffering. Peter explains that idea for us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. He says, for to this you've been called because Christ also suffered for you, here it is, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Can we say that we're following in his steps as we suffer? 
heart? Are we, are we blameless? Do we fully entrust ourselves to God? That's the pattern that's been set for us. And one more thought here about the suffering of Jesus. It's that it makes our suffering meaningful. When we suffer, and we're still clinging to God in the midst of it, when we suffer for the right, in the right way for the right reasons, we're suffering for Him. We're suffering for His glory. And the apostles came to view their suffering that way. Acts chapter 5 tells us, uh, of a time when they were beaten for their faith by the Jewish council. They were charged to no longer speak in the name of Jesus. And I love this verse. verse Acts 5.41 says, Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They considered it a privilege to be identified with Jesus and to represent him in their suffering. So we need to cling to this truth that Jesus suffered. Because in it we find both the good news of our salvation, but also the the strength to persevere. That we're following our Savior. We're following in His footsteps as we persevere through suffering. There's a second truth that comes out in this passage It's that Jesus hears. I mean, we live in a noisy world, and and, you know, it seems like everywhere you go, you find people wearing headphones, right? People will be driving down the road with big headphones on, you know, from, I mean, sometimes it's the tiny little earbuds that are almost invisible to the big, expensive, noise-canceling models. And when you've got those on, you, you really, you can live in your own world. You can be oblivious to everything else going on around you. But on the other hand, headphones also can allow you to focus, to listen in to something very important. And I think suffering kind of works the same way. It works like headphones. Right? Our natural inclination when we get into suffering is, is to turn inward. It's just our, our, our knee-jerk response when we hurt. We become absorbed in our own pain. We tune out everything else. But I want to suggest to you that it doesn't have to be that way. This, as we continue here in Luke 18, verses 35 to 41, I think it shows us that suffering can make someone more receptive to God. Um, And we see also how Jesus, even as he heads into his suffering, he tunes into someone's cries and hears. Take a look at verses 35 to 41. It says, As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. Now, Matthew and Mark, in their Gospels, they they also tell this story. And they give us a few extra details about it. One interesting part is they both, Matthew and Mark both say that the encounter happens as Jesus leaves Jericho. And so uh, several suggestions have been made as to how to reconcile that with the detail that Luke says here that occurs as he nears the city. And I I think one possible explanation is that the the city of that day was probably built next to uh, the ruins of a previous version of the city. So Jesus may have been leaving one and entering the other. I mean, we don't know that for sure. There could be other explanations here. But Matthew tells us that there were two blind men there on that occasion. And Mark says that, uh, Mark only mentions one, but he, he, he actually says that his name is Bartimaeus, or that he's called Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Now, it's, a, it's an interesting name. Some people uh, draw upon, drawing upon Greek suggest that Timaeus means honored, which kind of seems ironic in light of this man's predicament, right? The son of the honored one. But 
in Hebrew or Aramaic, the root of this name Timaeus means unclean. And so perhaps Bartimaeus was a derogatory nickname, son of uncleanness. It certainly seems to fit with the way people treat him here. And because his blindness leaves him with no alternative in that society, but begging by the roadside. Uh, so this man, catch this, he is well acquainted with suffering. We, don't, we know very little about his story, but, but that part is very clear. And yet, he does something very surprising here. He refers to Jesus as the son of David. Now that's a, a title reserved for the Messiah the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. Now, now this man, I mean, he probably never had the opportunity to travel and listen to Jesus teach, right? But somehow he's, he's heard stories from travelers about the miracles Jesus has done. And while other people debated about who this Jesus of Nazareth might be, this man's suffering, I think, gives him a sense of clarity. I mean, who else could, could cleanse unclean lepers? Who else could make lame men walk or give blind men sight? See, all those miracles were previews of the coming kingdom. And so he cries out for the king, right, the son of David, to have mercy upon him. Now Jesus then, Jesus is, is just passing through, right? He's on the road. He's headed toward Jerusalem. He's just talked about all that's going to happen there, the suffering. And so there must be this sense of determination in his stride as he heads toward that. I mean, if you or I were in his place, we'd probably be completely self-absorbed in that moment. And he's surrounded by a noisy crowd. And, and as the blind man's crying out, they're rebuking him. They're telling him to shut up. And yet Jesus, in the midst of all of that, right? He's aware, he hears, he stops, and he takes the time to listen to this man that everyone else ignores, everyone else uh, pushes aside and, and really just, just treats him like an annoyance. You know, Jesus responds that way to every believer. Because he suffered, he sympathizes with us in our suffering. And the author of, of Hebrews talks about that. Uh, he, he explains that Jesus represents us now in heaven and, and intercedes for us as our high priest. In Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, he says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So he concludes, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So Jesus knows what it's like to suffer. He sympathizes with us. He hears when we pray, when we cry. But, but beyond that, we also, he also sends the Holy Spirit to, to work in our lives. You know, he promised uh, his disciples the night before he's crucified that he would send them a helper or a comforter, some translations say, to be with them forever. And Paul describes the Spirit's work in Romans 8, 26 by saying, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So we can find strength in knowing that we're, we're never alone in our suffering. Even in those times when we're so overwhelmed that we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit's there interceding. And Jesus hears, he sympathizes, he pleads our case with God the Father. So cry for mercy. Cast your burden upon him. I love these words in Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests 
be made known to God. And he says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. One more truth from this passage. And it's that Jesus saves. I think a lot of us view life as if we're looking through a microscope. What I mean is that we, we kind of zoom in closer and closer to focus on smaller and smaller things. It's like we're just determined to find something wrong, right? something to worry about. And then once we identify it, we magnify it, right? Until it obscures our perspective, until it fills our entire outlook, until it defines our life. But God wants us to view life as if we're looking through a telescope. He lifts our eyes so that we look off into eternity. He reveals our place in the grand scope of His redemptive plan, and He he shows us His glory to give us genuine perspective on life here and now. And so whatever suffering we face, we can find meaning and purpose for our lives in the truth that Jesus saves. Now, I think the blind man here in this passage experiences that kind of powerful change of perspective. But I think a lot of our English translations obscure it. Take a look at verse 42. The English Standard Version that I'm reading from translates it by saying, And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. The New International Version says, Your faith has healed you. But we find a more literal translation, truer to the original Greek, in in the King James Version, which says, Thy faith hath saved thee. Right now, the man here, he's concerned about the problem of his immediate suffering, right? It's no small issue. He's been dealing with blindness. It, It really has defined his life. And he wants to recover his sight. He believes that Jesus is the Messiah and that he has the power to heal him. But why does Jesus do it? Why does he heal? We've seen this before in the Gospel of Luke. He does it uh, as a a sign, as a preview of what life will be like in his kingdom. And so I think what's happening here is Jesus doesn't just restore the man's sight. He reveals that this man is now saved because he's believed, because he's had faith. Because he shows faith. I think he's giving this man the promise that he'll enjoy eternal life in Christ's kingdom. And I think the man's response here shows that he begins to grasp this big picture. Take a look at verse 43. It tells us, and immediately he recovered his sight and followed him glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. And so he rejoices over his physical healing, but he doesn't stop there. He begins to follow Jesus. In other words, he becomes a disciple. He begins to glorify God. At that moment, I'm sure he's he's speaking words of praise and thanksgiving to God. And other people around him, they're so moved by it that they join in with him. But I think I think it's safe to assume that in that moment, this man begins to live for the glory of God. So so what is this truth, this gospel truth that Jesus saves, how does that apply when we face suffering? Because, you know, he doesn't promise to heal everyone here and now. There's no guarantee of that. There's no guarantee that every blind man is going to regain his sight. It doesn't work that way. But he offers to everyone the hope of salvation if they'll trust in him and follow him. It gives us this anticipation that in eternity there won't be any more death or pain or suffering. So this this telescopic view looking out into the distance, it gives us a sense of, of perspective. It helps us see through the immediate suffering beyond to things of ultimate importance. 
And you know, I think that's the perspective we find articulated in, in the model prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples. We often call it the Lord's Prayer. It's recorded in Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. Let's walk through it for a moment. Jesus begins by saying, these are probably familiar words to you. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's the idea that God uh, deserves to be treated as, as holy by every human being. He's worthy of praise and honor and glory, and so we should pray for that and live to bring that about. And so how does that tie into our suffering? Well, he might receive the most glory by healing us and taking away whatever the problem is, right? Fixing our suffering. But on the other hand, he might receive the most glory if we trust him and live for him in the midst of that suffering. Right? Isn't that what happened with Job? He had to go through it. And so pray for God's name to be hallowed, for God to be glorified. Next, Jesus tells us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When, when Jesus returns to reign as king, everything on earth will be brought into line with God's revealed will. Right? Everything will be the way God originally designed it to be. And so, in a sense, the coming of the kingdom is the ultimate answer to all our problems and concerns. Pray for the kingdom to come. But while we wait for that to happen, pray for people to bow to his will here and now. For, For unbelievers to come to repentance, for believers to grow in obedience. And as we've already seen in God's wisdom Sometimes he uses suffering to bring that obedience about, right? to humble us, to accomplish these goals in a person's life. As we move on through the Lord's Prayer, the next line, verse 11 says, give us this day our daily bread. Right? Seeing the big picture of salvation, thinking about eternity and the kingdom, that doesn't mean that, that we should ignore our basic needs. And on the contrary, God knows what we need to survive. And so this request shows a humble dependence upon him. We should look to him for, for physical sustenance. We should look to him for emotional strength to persevere through whatever difficulties we face. And then Jesus concludes that prayer with three requests that relate to our personal efforts to avoid sinful behavior. He says, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And let, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right, think about it. Suffering plays a major role in our fight against temptation. Lots of times, we use our pain as an excuse for disobeying God. But we, we need to realize suffering never justifies our sins. So we come to God and we seek forgiveness. And then we reflect that forgiveness in how we relate to others. And we, we pray that God would lead us away from temptation and evil. And so all of that really ties back to that core essential truth that Jesus saves. That That truth has to influence the way we see everything. That we look at all of life from that perspective of what Christ is doing and of his coming kingdom. So, we don't have to be blinded by our suffering. We may feel that way initially. That may be our initial impulse. But we need to remember that we can see through it. We can look beyond it. Because Jesus suffered, and because Jesus hears, and because Jesus saves. Have you been saved? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? If not, you could take that step today. He offers to forgive your sin and to give you the hope of eternal life. Believe in Him. Begin to follow Him. If you want to learn more about 
persevering through suffering. Another passage of Scripture that I think is really helpful is 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, the whole book of 1 Peter really addresses that, that subject of dealing with suffering as a believer. But there's also some immediate steps we could take in response to this passage today. Maybe you need to renew your focus on, on praying, on trusting the Lord. And you can use that model prayer that Jesus gives us as a guide. Or maybe, uh, as you th- see this miracle that this man experiences, it, it brings to mind the ways that God's worked in your life. And, and maybe you feel compelled to speak of God's glory. Look for an opportunity this week to tell someone who he is and what he's done. May God's name be hallowed through us.